Du, du, du. Talk. <laughs> Hi, I'm Winfried Gerling and today we have here with us Mark Butler from the University of Potsdam from the Digital Games Research Center. So welcome, Mark. Oh, thank you, Winfried. Let's speculate a little uh, about the future of storytelling in games or maybe only about the future of games. I don't know, we will see. If you think of all the different types of games and all the possibilities in computer-generated worlds today, why are more or less all games in a mode of simulating 3D worlds in a 2D representational way as we know it from our reception or maybe from the physical world or better from the mediation of this world uh, like in photography or film? Well, first, first off, thank you for the kind words, Winfried. And um, it's, a, it's a wonderful question to start off on because it, um, what, as you point out, games are still stuck in this mode of going for, you know, a uh, type of realism that, you know, art strived for in its early stages. And, and games are a very young medium. They, they haven't started to discover all the possibilities that, you know, the historical avant-garde discovered in the 20th century. I mean, you know, when you think of about cubism, dataism, uh, surrealism, I mean, all of these different frontiers are still open for games. At the moment, they're trying to create photorealistic 3D geometrical spaces that work like the world we know, most games. There are obviously very interesting experiments out there that <clears throat> jump between time structures that create non-Euclidean spaces, and these kind of approaches obviously open up completely new storytelling possibilities. And um, all I can say is, you know, uh, the sky's the limit when it comes to games. We have not even begun to scratch the surface of what is possible, and I think we're going to be seeing much more uh, experimental games coming out. Um, I mean, already we have Beyond Two Souls, which I was talking about, yeah. which jumps within the narrative structure of the game where you, you get episodic, uh, just uh, spotlights shown on different periods and time of the protagonist, and then you jump forward in time, you jump backwards in time. Um, you have games like Alexander Bruce's Antichamber, which creates a world which looks like a 3D world in a 2D space, but it doesn't follow the laws of geometrical space as we know it. You can walk around in a circle and end up in a different spot. And so that demands of the player to um, sort of uh, dive into the impossible to make a progress in the game world. And there, there's all kinds of interesting stuff happening and so we can just be very curious of what's going to come our way. So that's like in Portal what you described already. Uh, is, it, is it another... It's direction. Well, Portal, Portal did worked with this kind of idea. Echo Chrome worked with this kind of yeah. idea. It's a game that's you know sort of like an MC Escher painting, but um, Anti Chamber goes much further along these lines because it's not just working with the um, spatial representation, but just also what can happen in this world and and, and um, the way that space bends and morphs and, and jumps because as you know different theorists has point pointed out, especially Mark Wolf, uh, games have their very own kind of spatial structure and they don't even have to adhere to the physical world as we know yeah, it. And that's so, um, that's what know, I wanted to know be yeah. because a lot of games refer to, to our known physical world and, and so it's like, it, it's, it seems like that it takes a long time that it changes. It's, it's true, it, it has taken a long time, but then again, you also have to see that games were trying to establish themselves as a you know, serious storytelling media to, that, that could compete with you know, uh, literature or then film, which is basically the main competitor um, as you know, companies like Rockstar Games or David Cage you know, see their work being, um, being presented. And so, so, so they were striving for you know, just showing, yes, we can do realistic stories. But once that's been established, I think we're going to see all kinds of very, very uh, interesting experiments going on. And, and so Portal, Echo Chrome, and a Chamber are just scratching the surface and they're well, pushing the boundaries as they do so. There's even more to be said. I mean, we were talking about space. You mentioned time as well. Um, and games also have the possibility that other media don't have. You know, when you have a film, you know, it's basically the pictures are going by 24 frames a second and it's just moving forward continuously. And obviously the story can jump back and forth, but the person viewing the story cannot you know, move the film around unless they're sitting at home on their 
watching it on their DVD player and then they can jump back and forth, but that's not what you're supposed to be doing. When it comes to games, uh, time becomes a spatial dimension. You can travel forward, you can travel backwards, you can slow it down like in Max Payne, you can speed it up. So obviously there's a lot um, that can be done there. And in general, the whole um, simulated physics of the game world, you know, the, the virtual physics is also another fascinating field to explore because uh, we don't have to have games worlds with gravity as we know it. You know, we don't have to have, um, you know, objects that behave the way we expect them to behave. And as games move from you know, showing us, you know, pre-rendered video animation of what happens in the game world to on-the-fly generation of realistically or, you know, surrealistically simulated game physics, then we're going to have worlds that will be able to offer us experiences that we can't have in our non-virtual life. Yeah, thanks a lot. I, <laughs> I appreciate that answer. Um, there are new platforms like the Xbox, uh, which is recognizing up to six different persons in a single room uh, with their movements and their so-called emotions, uh, because they somehow measure how you move and it's then called emotions. Uh, it stores a lot of individual data. Uh, what will be the effect? Or will there appear more individualization on on or in games, like regional or personal styles of the same game? Um, well, as, as you said in the beginning, we can only speculate what this, this will bring. Um, I think the possibility to have six people in front of the Kinect is, is not going to you know, go very far because I mean, the, the space that the Kinect can um, scan is, is limited. So you know, if you have six people moving around, then obviously the movements that are going to be possible are going to be fairly limited. Maybe you could do a game like Rock Band you know, um, in front of the Kinect without the you know, plastic guitar and drum interfaces. But the question is, you know, what, what have you gained by doing so? Much more interesting, I find the idea that gaming systems will be able to scan and capture um, emotional reactions of the player because this offers the possibility of making player emotions a part of the game mechanics. And um, we, we've, seen, we've seen something happen just recently uh, coming from the other direction, the, 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 the motion capture of, um, of actors' faces that are used to animate the game characters have gotten so sophisticated that the, the emotions of the actors have become a part of the game mechanics, like in L.A. Noir. Um, where you have to decide whether someone's lying to you or not. You're a detective, you're interrogating someone, you have to decide if they're lying or not, and then press a button. That's part of the game mechanics on the side of the computer-generated characters. Now, with the Xbox One, if it delivers on what it promises, we have the ability to have the computer react to the emotional responses of the players. Um, obviously, people are very different. So I don't know if it's possible to make a game where everyone cries at the same spot and that's the trigger to progress the story. But it, it definitely opens up some very interesting questions of what might be possible. And so that's, that's fascinating. And yeah, we're, we're definitely going to see a lot more individualization of the gaming content. You know, um, the, the system sees what you like. It can react to that. It can change the parameters of the game. It, it can, knows where you are. It knows where you are. And in, in it can definitely tailor the experience to your personal likes and dislikes. Yeah. Okay. With the introduction of Google Glass and other similar devices, a new quality of mixing realities arose. Is this a symptom for what Lev Manovich proposed with the concept of expanded reality? Can we say there is a turn from virtual reality to real virtuality? That's, that's a nice, <laughs> nice play on words. I've actually used that myself in, in, in a somewhat different way. Um, because when, when people talk about virtual reality, you know, oftentimes they act like it's you know, not really real and, and doesn't have an impact on, on real life. And obviously it has a major impact even as virtual reality. So there we are already dealing with real virtuality. But the, the whole topic you address, the question of, you know, Augmented reality, I think, was the first term to come up. And then mixed reality, I think, is more appropriate. Julian Oliver talks about improved reality. Um, but that's in reference to his art project, The Artvertiser, where he's replacing you know, billboard images with artworks. But um, in general, yes, Google Glass obviously opens up a completely new uh, dimension of gaming that has been there before, but obviously is not a mass phenomenon. It's, it's, it's alternate reality 
no, it's augmented reality gaming, alternate reality gaming is something else. It's so augmented reality gaming, it, the first experience were things like Pac-Man Hatton, you know, where people are using mobile devices to play Pac-Man in New York City, things like that. Um, if you have Google Glass at your disposal, basically you have a heads-up display in the, you know, uh, everyday non-virtual world and you can overlay uh, information um, screen over everything and then you can play video games while walking around, you know, your city, going to work. And basically, it's a further dissipation of the um, boundary separating work from play and it's, it's uh, uh, inherent quality of the digital media, I say per se, and it's just continuing uh, a development that has been ongoing for the last 40 years and um, yeah, I mean, we, we can at that point just start to imagine what it's going to feel like living in a computer game 24-7 because um, basically there are no limits on where the game could pop up in your day-to-day -day life. But again, that's, that's pure, pure speculation. I mean, there might be laws coming up that are going to try and regulate that. There might be, you know, <laughs> who knows, there might be certain uh, psychological problems people develop because they can't, you know, uh, really differentiate between game world, not game world. I mean, people always worry about that. I don't think that's a real problem. But if you think about popular films like uh, David Fincher's The Game, you know, obviously um, you, can, you can get a bit paranoid if you're constantly confronted with these highly meaningful messages that are trying to involve you in the story um, where at, you know, all you want to do is go to the corner and buy a cup of coffee. So I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm very curious to see what's going to happen. You know? Yeah, the me too. <laughs> How will games uh, change while accessing the same game from different kinds of interfaces or platforms? Like we have recently seen with the development of Sony Crossplay concept, which is only one of of a lot, I think, because if you have different interfaces like the iPad or the the iPhone or uh, any other uh, interface is, which is connected to the same game and the same status of the game, what will this change? Well, okay, first off, obviously, it's a completely different experience. If I'm, you know, sitting in the subway, playing, you know, a game, whatever, let's say Grand Theft Auto, I'm playing it in the subway, it's not as immersive as if I'm sitting at home in front of my big flat screen TV or even better, Beamer with my surround sound stereo system. Um, I, can, I can dive into that game in a completely different way than when I'm traveling um, outside. And so um, that's going to change the experience. I don't know how many players will want to do that. You know, some players will want to you know, max out the time because that, that's a serious problem when coming to games. They're just becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and demanding more and more of our time, which is becoming a much more precious resource. Um, so there might be a lot who, who will want to do that on their way to work, way back from work, another dissipation of the, you know, the, the boundary of the gaming sphere. But at the same time, I, I'm personally not too sure if these concepts are going to uh, go that far, especially when we're talking about games that are meant to be played not only on the console but with a mobile device in addition. Okay, yeah. um, in addition, it's a nice gimmick. You know, like, if I, like a second screen when playing a game in front of the computer or the. the for for example, TV. Beyond Two Souls, which I've talked about yeah. a lot today, um, offers the player to have a second player use their mobile device, their smartphone, to control the ghost form. Um, Aiden, the, the, the otherworldly friend of the protagonist Jody in the game world. And that offers some interesting possibilities. But basically, you know, if I'm playing the game, I obviously want to control not only Jody but also Aiden. And um, sometimes I'll want to do it with a friend, but you know, to, to be able to really experience the story and move through it, I'm, I'm going to play it in single player mode. And just like, you know, the, the Wii U um, sort of really tries to you know, build on this concept, and so far it's bombed. No, no one really wants to be looking at a touchscreen and playing a game up there. Somehow, that doesn't appeal to many people. It doesn't appeal to me. Um, but talking about interfaces, that raises a completely different uh, topic, which I personally find highly fascinating. It's, it's the question of what do new gaming interfaces like the Kinect or like the um, PlayStation Move, which basically have kinesthetics, have dance as their interaction paradigm, what kind of stories do they allow us to tell? And they, um, these interfaces underline the fact that games tell stories for the eyes, 
the ears, and the hands, or now the whole body. And, and, and that is an innate quality that only this medium has. And um, every new interface uh, offers new interaction, but also new narrative possibilities. Um, because uh, the best narration in games is the narration that doesn't sort of come as a side or something put on top, but something that um, basically emerges from the interactive structure of the gaming system itself. Okay, so in your opinion, are there other major changes going on in gaming story-wise which we didn't discuss or which you didn't think about in your lecture? I, I don't know, just to, yeah. to think. Well, about. when you, know, you asked me to, to do this talk, you, know, you said you wanted to talk about sort of, sort of basically visionary stuff too, you know, what's like really far out there on the horizon. And I don't want to go into like, you know, neural uplinks or, or that kind of brain computer interface because that's obviously, you know, uh, uh, fascinating, but still very far off, not so far off from what I think, but still fairly far off cup of tea. But um, when talking about really the, 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 the visionary future for, for game playing storytelling, I, um, I personally have this, um, uh, idea of game engines as story engines. Um, for me, that means a, a game engine that creates a story on the fly, as opposed to you know spooling off a, a, a story that someone has written and, and, and um, set in scene, and that the player sort of basically retraces the path that the designer set for them. Um, I think that in the future it will be possible for a game engine to generate a, a believable and consistent and compelling story. Um, from uh, 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 you know uh, basic programming that that, that is put into it um, that engages players on the level that stories do nowadays, and that that would basically be the deconstruction of the author per se, you know, in the form of the game engine. Um, it has a lot of prerequisites. You know, you you would have to um, uh, you know reach a stage where. Uh, semantic webs have become a reality where the computer program understands meaning so that I can leave, you know, uh, pre-scripted dialogue structures and basically I could say anything and nowadays you don't have to type things, you can actually speak with the computer. He understands me and he reacts to that. That would be one prerequisite. Another prerequisite would be to re have, well, not, not so much a prerequisite, but another vision would be to have uh, computer-controlled game characters that pass the Turing test, right? that um, really are so believable that I don't know if it's a computer playing or another human being. Um, another vision, and, and it's, it's, it's something that should, needs to be stressed that we haven't reached yet, is game characters that ha overcome the uncanny valley. We have this development toward more and more realistic graphics and, and, and enactment of game characters, but they still seem eerily inhuman. You know, I'm waiting for the day that, you know, I can't differentiate between a game-controlled character and uh, an actor, for example. The, the last point I want to make, and, and this is actually more close to uh, the here and now than, than all the others I've made, um, is uh, what I want to call user-generated story content. You know, um, we're seeing it in very many other fields. Um, we We've seen it beginning with, with games now, you know, Rockstar Games has the Rockstar Games Social Club and, you know, users can create their own little videos of their gameplay, they create mechanism and they can put them online, they're sharing it with each other. Obviously, this, this is something that's very interesting for players. At the same time, you also have, you know, emergent stories coming out of player interaction in these massively multiplayer yeah. online games. So, like, Eve like Online. funerals of... of Funerals, or my, my favorite example is EVE Online. I mean, there you have players, you know, numerous players, um, orchestrating the downfall of a very powerful player over the course of many months, you know, sort of luring her away from her powerful battleship so that they can, you know, get on board and to just crash her entire empire. And this, this kind of um, development is, is, is more intriguing than anything any designer could come up with. So, so obviously that's already going on, but what, what I mean when I talk about user-generated story content is that um, I, I see a future where designers open up the game engine, and this is something that they've done in other fields in the past, you know, and letting players mod the engine, but um, giving users the tools they need to create their own story episodes and um, you know, have probably having some kind of editorial system in place to sort of filter out 
the bad content and get the really good content and giving users a place to put that online so that within the story world of a game, you know, users can create their own episodes to let other players play them. I think there's a great future for that. And, and the whole move is away from these closed games that are, you know, um, basically in the, just, on a DVD and are, are, are have a beginning, middle, end up to creating game worlds that are continuously expanding, are very alive, and are on the one hand being expanded through downloadable content created by the game companies, but then also downloadable content created by the players themselves. Or pl being played in the cloud, where or, you don't yeah. have to download anything at all. For example, so yeah. yeah. That, that would be another development. So It's true. Forgot about the cloud, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, Steve. Um, <laughs> Right. Yeah, uh, that leads me to, to the last really stupid question, but do you think cinema will die? No, <laughs> no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Cinema does something completely different than games. And, you know, I think the whole rivalry between games and cinema, you know, is, you know, it, 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 it's good to sort of get the creative juices flowing, but at the end, it misses the point because games are an interactive experience. You know, I need to be completely differently engaged with a game to partake in that experience and um, cinema offers me something else. Cinema offers me these audiovisual stories that are you know designed by um, you know in, in the best case very talented um, directors um, and uh, you know convey to me a story that I want to listen to and um, I, I don't know with me it's, it's, it's a very uh, clear decision in the evening. You know, I have three hours time, what am I going to do? Some nights I want to watch a movie, some nights I want to play a game. It, they definitely have a future of coexistence. So, thanks a lot, Mark. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks a lot for being with us, Mark, and your uh, rich input you gave. And uh, thanks for you all being with us, and see you next week, hopefully. <laughs>